Hey, please turn with me to Luke chapter number 6 in your Bibles today, Luke chapter number 6. We began studying the book of Luke some time ago, and it has been on this theme of knowing Jesus with certainty. And uh, last week, it was that familiar passage where they sailed across the Sea of Galilee, and a storm erupted on the sea. Jesus was asleep, and the disciples were afraid. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. And we mentioned last week, when Jesus, if Jesus says we're going to the other side, be sure you're not going to go under. Jesus will get you to the other side. And the, so the subject for last week was, know that Jesus is worth trusting. And I, I can stand here today and tell you, I, I know Jesus is worth trusting. It's worth trusting. Worth trusting with your soul for eternity. Worth trusting with your life. He's worth trusting with your marriage. He's worth trusting with your parenting. He's worth trusting with your finances. Jesus is worth trusting. And we can put our faith in him. He said to his disciples, where is your faith? Uh, when they were so worried there on the, on the Sea of Galilee. This morning we'll be in chapter number 6, verses 1 through 11. And today I want us to see this, that Jesus is bigger than a day. He's bigger than a day. And I think you'll see the day we're talking of when we begin to read the scriptures uh, in chapter number 6 uh, and verse number 1. So if you just follow along with your eyes uh, as I read audibly here in uh, chapter number 6, where the Bible says this, And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first, that he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this, what David did when he when himself was in hunger, and they which were with him? How he went into the house of God, and it did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which is not, it is not lawful to eat before the priests alone. And he said unto them, that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts, and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up, and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. I hope that after reading that passage, you can sort of detect or understand or, or sense the day I'm speaking of. Jesus is better and bigger than a day. And that day in our story is the Sabbath day. I want to take a few moments and talk about the Sabbath because I believe that Luke was uh, in, in, in the inspiration of this passage that we are reading today, that Luke was taking his time so that Theophilus would understand that Jesus is more important than the Sabbath. Jesus said in this passage, and it's recorded for us also in Matthew, it's recorded in Mark, and it's recorded in Luke, this same phrase. And here is the phrase, that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. It's mentioned in all three uh, synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Sabbath day for a Jew, your life revolved around that day. Everything you scheduled, everything you planned, everything you knew, everything you grew up with, your life revolved around the Sabbath day. The calendar of days, not only the Sabbath that was weekly, but the special Sabbaths that were throughout the year. Your life would move and function based on how that Sabbath would fall and, and the scheduling of what you would do and, and, and the things that you would uh, uh, take part in on, on, a, on a life basis would all be, be dependent upon the Sabbath day. 
You remember that even in the New Testament when Jesus was crucified, that the Sabbath played a huge part in removing the body and burying the body because your life revolved around the Sabbath. It meant everything. When Jesus is here in the synagogue and when his disciples are rubbing the, 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 the grain to eat and when a man with a withered hand needs healing, Jesus is teaching a powerful lesson about the Sabbath. And it is this, he says, I am Lord over the Sabbath. Which means, here's what the average Jew had done. The Sabbath had been elevated and God had been lowered. Everything about that day and the rules of the day and the specialness of the day and the requirements of the day and the, and the scheduling of the day had been taken to a high place of importance. And when it comes to the Lord and when it comes to God, he had been placed down. And Jesus said, I'm more important than any of these days. The Pharisees had made it a complex and confusing system. The Pharisees had made the Sabbath a burdensome thing, a thing that was heavy, a thing that was very strict. In fact, they had made 37 specific laws about the Sabbath, and the Pharisees actually, the Pharisees were the religious leaders. The Pharisees actually made themselves Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, if you want to do something on the Sabbath, you talk to us. If you've got some Sabbath issue, you come to us. They had made themselves Lord over the Sabbath. They had changed it from something that was intended to be beautiful. They had changed it from something that God had intended to be simple to something that was complex and a burden. And Jesus sets them straight. Now you know that the Sabbath is listed in the Ten Commandments. Those are found in Exodus chapter number 20. And the Bible says this, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That is in Exodus chapter number 20. And I want to say a word because the question always comes up and we don't have time to address it in depth. But someone would say, well, I always thought the Sabbath was the seventh day when God rested from creation. In other words, he created on day one, he created on day two, he created on day three, he labored on day four, and he labored on day five, and then he labored on day six when he created man, and then on the seventh day he rested. So someone would say, well, why is it that your church is meeting on Sunday? And I want to address that very uh, quickly and, and with some scripture as well. But the Bible says that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. That's in Mark chapter number 2 and verse number 27. I believe the New Testament facts, as we read the New Testament from beginning to end, I believe the New Testament signifies very uh, emphatically the why and the how of the Sabbath, and that's the most important. The why and the how of the Sabbath is more important than the Saturday or the Sunday of the Sabbath. The why and the how. The Pharisees had forgotten the why and the how. And also I wanted to add by way of introduction that every Old Testament shadow pointed toward Jesus Christ. So everything in the Old Testament was pointers, was, was, was indicators that Jesus would come. And that's why Jesus could say, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. If you have questions on why we gather and meet on Sundays, and by the way, I love Sunday. Sunday is one of my favorite days. And I love Sundays. I love the gathering of the saints uh, and, and I wanted to say also this morning, uh, uh, our church did not close at all during this, this pandemic. The doors were always open for every service. And um, I want to tell you why that is. Uh, because our church has always operated that anybody can come into this building who chooses to come into this building. When we lock the doors, we have said, don't you come. Don't come. And I, I said several times at the beginning, and I haven't said it much since, but I don't want to stand before the Lord having said to anybody, don't come here. Don't come here. I'm glad we live in a free country. And I'm thankful that our governor even made allowances for churches to be open in Ohio, and it's in the, governor's, uh, in the, in the orders that were given by the governor. I'm very thankful for that. But I want the church on Sunday to be available. I want the worship of the saints to be available. I want the opportunity to sing and to pray and, 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 and to hear preaching to be available. And we tried to make that available. I never want church to become a, a rule or a law like the Pharisees made it. What we re are reading in chapter number 6 is what I never want Sunday to become. Never. But I do believe there's some very helpful things about Sunday. 
Let me give you some New Testament scriptures. I, I think we'll enjoy this and learn today. Of course, I, I want it to be a help for us. The New Testament pattern. What is the New Testament pattern? And how did Sunday even come to play? How did the first day of the week come into play? Well, you should know this, and I believe many of you do, that in John chapter number 20, the Bible says, Mary Magdalene came early to the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. And what day was that on? That was on the first day of the week. So on the first day of the week is when the reality of the resurrection uh, came to these, uh, to these disciples. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that points us toward the first day of the week. Let me give you some more. Jesus appeared to his disciples on the first day of the week. Let me read this passage to you in John chapter 20 also. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut and when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And the Bible takes this extra care to say that was on the first day of the week when Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. Do you know also that the early Christians gathered on the first day of the week? And the Bible says it this way. They gathered on the first day of the week in Acts 20, and they did it for fellowship, which was breaking of bread, and for prayers. Let me, let me read this scripture to you, just one verse. And upon the first day of the week, this is Acts 20, when the disciples came together to break bread, and here's what else happened. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech. Anybody know how long Paul preached on that first day of the week? It was until midnight. No worries today, it won't happen here on this particular Sunday, but Paul preached until midnight on this first day of the week. Christians were gathered, they broke bread, they fellowshiped, and Paul opened the word of God and preached to them in Acts chapter number 20. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter number 16 and verse number 2 that when the Christians gather on the first day of the week, listen to this, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come. So Paul said, every time you meet on the first day of the week, bring your offerings together. And he says, when I come through, I'm ministering to the churches. I'll gather up what has been brought on the first day of the week and I'll take that to the churches to minister to them. And the, the word of God specifically says that it was the first day of the week. There's sufficient Bible evidence for Christians gathering and meeting and preaching and fellowshipping and growing and singing on the first day of the week. So with all of that being said about Sunday, can we just take a brief look at the Sabbath, really from Luke chapter number 6, and understand why God instituted that Sabbath in the first place. I'm not specifically saying whether it was Saturday or whether it is Sunday. I'm saying what is the why and the how? I hope that interests you. And here's number one. Here's why and the how of why God uh, instituted the Sabbath. The first was this. It was for worship. It was for worship. Now the Pharisees had made it a complex system of laws and regulations. I may have shared with you before that when my wife and I were in Israel, many, several of the Jews there in Israel still observe the Sabbath and their rules are very strict even to this day. We stayed in, uh, in one particular hotel uh, where there was an elevator, and we were warned ahead of time. They said, now look, on the Sabbath, which was Saturday, they said the elevator is going to operate a little different. And they said the operator, the elevator is programmed on the Sabbath day to stop at every single floor. So you stop at floor two, the door's open, nobody's there, the door's closed. Stop at floor three, door's open, uh, and, and, and close whether, whether anybody has pushed the button or not. And we asked the question, we said, why does the elevator stop at every floor on the Sabbath in Israel? And our, uh, our guide said, because it is believed that if you push the button, that is work on the Sabbath day. And here, here I am thinking, well, if that's considered work around here, uh, it's a lot different from where I come from. But the laws are still very strict, even to this day. When the Lord God put into practice in that Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day to keep it, anybody remember the next word? Holy. Holy. In other words, one day, and I, 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 some of this is going to come from my own heart today because I think it's important for us to remember. I believe it's a very good practice for a Christian to take one day out of seven and keep it uniquely holy. And I'm not here to make laws or, or rules or some kind of stringent thing. But I believe it's helpful to a nation, to a family, to a person, to a society, to take one day out of seven and keep it uniquely holy. 
a uniquely holy day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath day was spiritual in nature. And the Sabbath day was, was uh, designed for the connecting of the people. It was designed for the gathering of the people. The families would go to the synagogue together. The families would go to the temple together. Their offerings would be brought together on the Sabbath day. There would be the reading of the Word of God on the Sabbath day. In fact, in Luke, you're sort of close by here. Look at Luke chapter number 4 and see what Jesus did on the Sabbath day. Uh, it was a holy day for worship. In chapter number 4 and verse number 16. Now notice this about the, the, the Sabbath here in, in verse number 16 of chapter number 4. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. This is verse 16. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And what did he do? And he stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. That's the same as Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the rec and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say, unto them this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And we won't continue reading on, but can you sort of see what they were doing on the Sabbath? They were gathered. They came together to a place. The word of God was opened and it was read. Not only was it read, but Jesus took the time to say, let me explain to you what this means. And all that's happening on the Sabbath day. It was a special day which was spiritual in nature. It was a day to remember God, to remember the Lord, to connect with God, to remove yourself from the world. It was a day that was holy. It was a day that was different. And if I can give one of my regrets for the day that we live in, uh, in, in our culture, Sunday is becoming like every other day. And you say, well, is there a rule? Is there some kind of rule that makes that a problem? Does someone sin if, it, if they make it like every other day? I don't think so, but I will tell you this. I think we sacrifice a lot spiritually when, when there's not one day out of seven that's just holy, just special. It's one day out of seven when we don't worry about our career. It's one day out of seven when we don't worry about making a dollar. It's one day out of seven when we don't worry about maintenance on the house. It's one day out of seven when we sort of take all of that out there and say, not today. Not today. Today is a holy day. Today is a special day. I want to take one day out of seven and make it different. I do not believe that someone needs to go to church to be a Christian. And I get that question a lot. Do you believe I need to go to church to be a Christian? Of course the answer is no. A person becomes a Christian by trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior. Very clear in the Word of God. But can you, will you just go along a certain pathway of thought for me? Don't you think it just makes sense that a Christian would want to worship with other Christians? Uh, maybe I'll make this parallel. Does a man have to go to his son's baseball game to be a dad? The answer is no. You can still be a dad and not go to your son's little league game. But won't we all agree that if a dad doesn't want to go ever, that that's a little weird, right? Let, let me express it a little bit further. Does, does, a, does a man have to go out to eat with his wife to be a husband? I don't think it's written in the code, right? But I'll tell you this. If your wife says, let's go out to eat, we'll be able to talk and spend some time together, and you say, no, I don't need to do that to be your husband. That's not written in the book anywhere. I just don't need to. If that's the approach that we take, it's saying something really strong about relationship. And I'm, I don't want to make rules about a day. I don't want to make rules about the Sabbath. The Pharisees did that. But I think there's a lot of indicators about wanting to worship, talk to the Lord, and sing a hymn, and, and hear the word of God read, Hear the word of God preached. Have some prayers together. It's a very powerful thing. To have one day out of seven where your spiritual batteries are recharged. We got a couple golf carts at our house, and they're electric golf carts, and the batteries do die. My kids don't believe it, but yes, they do die. They will run them till they are smoking. <laughs> 
and the smoke's coming out of the cells. But at some point, you have to recharge it. We all understand you've got to recharge it. We don't like to think about this, but we have physical batteries and we have spiritual batteries. And we need to recharge our spiritual batteries. And I, this day is a day where my spiritual batteries get recharged. It's a day when that happens for me, where I get plugged back into the Lord. Not only was the Sabbath instituted to be a holy day, a day that was different than all the rest, a day which the career and the job and, and, the, and the life and, and the world is sort of set aside as a holy day, but it's also a day of rest. And this is what the Word of God says in Exodus uh, chapter number 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now listen to this. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do, not do any work. Thou, thy son, thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And I wanted to talk about rest today. What kind of rest? Rest doesn't always mean idleness. Rest doesn't have to mean sleep. Rest, I believe, in this case, means spiritual rejuvenation. Rest, spiritual rejuvenation. I will tell you this, the world will beat you up. This sinful world, the rat race of this world, will beat you and spit you out. And having a day, one day out of seven, when we're spiritually rejuvenated, is such a wonderful thing for the Christian. To change the F emphasis from the secular to the Lord uh, I am not saying today that if someone works on Sunday, they're sinning. There's been plenty of Sundays that I go out to eat, and I expect a waitress or a cook to be able to prepare my meal. I, I couldn't do that if I believed it was a sin to work on Sunday. But I do believe that in this labor, God created everything on day one and day two up through day six, and on day seven, God rested. And I wanted to ask you this. Was God tired? That's something to think about. I mean, did after God created man from the dust of the ground, did God go, man, I'm just whipped? God wasn't tired. Wasn't tired. I don't think Sunday is required so much because I'm tired. But I believe one day out of seven is a good practice because it gives me spiritual rest. Spiritual rest. Spiritual rejuvenation. The Pharisees abused this principle in this way. And the story is given to us in chapter 6. If you're there back at our text, Jesus referred back to an Old Testament story that you can find there in the book of 1 Chronicles, I believe. And verse number 3 where Jesus said, Have ye not read so much as this, what David did when he when himself was in hunger, and they which were with him? How he went into the house of God, and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them which were with him, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. And I suppose it was these Pharisees that had forgotten about that Old Testament story. You can read it for yourself. David and his men had been in battle. They had been fighting for the Lord. They had been fighting for their nation. They had been fighting the cause of right. And they were hungry. And when they passed through, the priest said, all we have is this showbread, which is technically not supposed to be for you. It's supposed to be for the operation of the temple and the operation of the service and supposed to be for the priests only. And David said, but we're hungry. I'm hungry. My men are hungry. And we've been fighting and, 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 and doing the work. We've been active. And David ate. And those that were with him ate. And I'm sure there were some that would have stood by that said, rule breaker. But the Sabbath was never for the rules. It was for its purpose, for what it does. They were hungry from battle, and the, the bread that they received was able to give them the rest to continue on in what they, it was called upon them to do. Jesus said, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. If I can give you a personal testimony. I got saved when I was six years old. I got saved because a church bus came and picked me up from the inner city of Cleveland off of Denison Avenue. I got saved because someone took me into, by, my, by the hand into a little Sunday school room when I was in first grade. And a Sunday school teacher opened up a Bible and with simple Sunday school material showed me about Jesus Christ, how he died for me and loved me and gave his life for me. 
And I went out into the junior church. After Sunday school, we had junior church. Sunday school was 10, junior church at 11. Went out into the junior church hour and listened to the, uh, to the sermon and, and to the message of the junior church. And I don't remember a whole lot about that morning, but I do remember this. The invitation was given. Do you want to be saved and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? It was June of 1982. And I remember going back into the classroom where the teacher was and kneeling down at little chairs and asking Jesus to be my Savior and forgive me my sin. I can't explain it completely. But I know that once I got saved, I wanted that bus to pick me up every single Sunday. It wasn't programmed into me. It wasn't as this if someone took out a manual and showed me how it was necessary. But man, I wanted to grow in my faith. I wanted to be there when the Bible was open. I wanted to be there when the prayers were prayed. I wanted to be there to be able to sing the songs about heaven. I continued coming to church on Sunday morning. The buses were running on Sunday morning. They picked me up on Sunday morning. I didn't even know that there was other services like a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. Someone said, they said, you know, there's services on Sunday night and there's services on Wednesday night. Well, my folks were not going to bring me. And, um, you know, 10 years old, I wasn't driving. So uh, they said, would you like to go to church on Sunday night? You know what my answer was? Yes. Of course I want to come. They said, we'll pick you up. And the car that would come pick up my brother and I, it was that little... Dodge, um, two-door Dodge car, and uh, they had a car seat. They, there was a married couple with a baby and this little tiny back seat and this little sports car. And by then I was like six foot three, and I squeezed in the back of that little sports car and rode to church. I wanted to be there. I didn't feel like I was required to be there. I wanted to be there. The Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath. It's a good practice, and I, maybe I'm preaching the choir. We're all here. You're like, preacher, we're all here. <laughs> we are here, we came. Praise God. But I believe it's a good practice to take one day out of seven. It's going to be a little different. It's going to be a holy day, a unique day, a day with not all of that, a day with something different, a day to recharge me spiritually, a day to connect with the Lord, a day to get some scripture, a day to pray, a day to sing, a day to bring an offering. It's going to be one day out of seven. Now, as I close, I, here's where I want to be careful. Jesus is better than the day. That's how I started the message this morning. Jesus is better and bigger than the day. You say, why did you say that? Because it is, a, it is absolutely possible and practiced that some will enjoy the day without knowing the person of the day. Some will enjoy the events of the day without knowing the Lord of the day. And so here's how I want to end. Do you know the Lord of the Sabbath? Do you know the Lord of the Sabbath? Jesus said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. Do you know him? Do you know the one that is Lord of this day? Do you know the one that is Lord of yesterday? Do you know the one that is Lord of tomorrow? Oh, he'll give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. He said, I will give you rest. And one other thing that I wanted to say in close, and I'm trying to bring this all in a good, timely fashion. There is coming a rest for the people of God. I don't think we talk about heaven enough. You know, here in this world we toil and we labor and we struggle. And this life is indeed a lot of, lot of, lot of, a lot of difficulty. But the Word of God says it this way, that, that there is coming a day when the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And notice this, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Here's what I wanted to say to close. I believe heaven is going to be a forever Sunday. Maybe some are saying, that just sounds weird, Pastor, a forever Sunday. I believe it's going to be a forever Sunday. 
No punching the clock. No cutting the grass. No worrying about the flower bed. No rushing to the grocery store. I, I, I can't explain it to you completely, but I know it's going to be my forever rest with the Lord. And I look forward to that. I really do look forward to that. I pray that you're saved and that you'll know that as well. Can we bow our heads for a prayer?